to determine the reading of the voltmeter in the given circuit, what we will do is mark two points and label them. We'll call this point right here point A, and then this point right here is going to be point B. And basically we're trying to find the potential difference between those two points. And to do that, we're going to be using what is known as the loop rule. In the loop rule, you pick two points, as we've already done, and then you travel from one point to the other along the circuit. Now, there are many paths we could travel to go from point A to point B, but the simplest path, or the most useful path here, will be to go in this sort of counterclockwise direction here. Now, as we move from point A to point B, we need to keep track of potential changes. And so here's what we'll do. We'll write out the potential difference traveling from point A to point B. And this will equal the following. So let's move along the loop in a counterclockwise direction. And the first circuit element that we will encounter is this battery. And you'll notice that because we're moving counterclockwise, we would be moving from the positive plate downwards, so to speak, to the negative plate. So when you move in that direction from a positive plate to a negative plate, you're going to be losing electrical potential. And so that will be a negative change in electrical potential. We would write that as negative 4.5 volts. We continue our journey in a counterclockwise fashion through the loop and we encounter another battery, but this time we would be moving from the negative to the positive plate. That will be a positive change in electric potential. So we will write that as positive 6 volts. And after traveling past that battery, we encounter point B. We have traversed the loop and therefore we can simply add the right hand side together and we would get positive 1.5 volts. That would be the correct answer for the reading of the voltmeter. We next need to figure out the reading produced by the ammeter which measures the current. To do that is going to be a lot more challenging. So we're going to come down here, magnify the circuit, and what we have done is we have labeled some currents. We have some current flowing to the right through the upper portion of the circuit. We have called that current I. And we have arbitrarily chosen its direction. We're making it go to the right. We don't necessarily know that that's the correct choice. If it's the wrong choice, then later on the, in the calculation, we would get a negative value for that current. And if it does turn out to be negative, we'll simply switch the direction of the current. But for now, we're basically going to guess that the current I is traveling to the right. And then through this segment of the circuit, we have labeled another current that we have called I2. We have it tra traveling to the left. In this segment, we have labeled a current I1, also traveling to the left. And then in the lower segment of the circuit, we have I3 traveling to the right. So that's really what you want to do is label currents in all segments of your circuit. Next, we're going to be applying a few loop rules, in fact. So for the first loop rule, we're going to start here We'll just label this start. And we're going to go clockwise all the way around the perimeter of the circuit until we encounter our original starting point. So we'll just call this the outermost loop. And as we go around the loop, we need to keep track of potential changes. Now, here we go, start at this point, move through the ammeter. There's actually no potential change through the ammeter, at least ideally. But we encounter this circuit element right here. This is a resistor. We have learned in previous chapters that the potential change across a resistor is simply the resistance value multiplied by the current. So in this case, the resistance value would be 6 ohms and then we would multiply that by the current. Note the current here is the one that we have marked with the letter I, so this would just be 6I. Also notice this, that as we move through the loop in this direction, we would be traveling in the same direction as the current. So when you apply your loop rules and you're moving in the same direction as the current, make sure that you put a negative sign in front of your potential change because moving with current represents a drop in potential as you go through the resistor. So that has to be labeled with a negative. We continue around in the clockwise fashion around the outermost section of the loop, and then we encounter this resistor here. Now notice you're going against the current because you're traveling to the left through your loop, but the current itself is going to the right. So because you're going against the current, that would be a positive potential change. And we would take the resistance value, which is six, and then multiply it by the current, which is I3. And then we continue and return to our starting point without encountering any other circuit elements. So once you return to the starting point, you set your potential changes equal to zero. So that takes care of our first loop rule. We will next examine the upper loop. And by upper loop, we clean up the diagram a little bit here. Whoops, I think we just erased that purple arrow that represented that current. 
If we go around the upper loop, what we're talking about is going around this loop right here. Okay, so we're still gonna start at the same point. We're gonna keep track of potential changes. So here we go. We're moving again in a clockwise fashion. So the first potential change would be that negative six times the current I. We go around here and make a turn. We encounter a battery. We're going from the negative to the positive plate. So that's a positive potential change. And the value itself is six volts. And then we encounter this resistor right here, the 10 ohm one. We can see that we're going with the current marked I2. So that would be a negative potential change and it would be 10 multiplied by I2. And then we set that equal to zero. So far, so good. We're gonna go and do one more loop rule. It's going to be the upper two thirds of this circuit. So we'll just label it accordingly. The upper two thirds would be this loop right here. So we'll go clockwise again, keeping track of potential changes. We go through the six ohm resistor right here. That's the same negative six I. And then we come around, we encounter this battery right here going from negative to positive. That would be a positive four and a half volt change. And then finally we go through this resistor. We're going with the current marked I1. So that would be a minus five I1 and then we would return to start, so this is equal to zero. So right now we have three equations generated by the loop rules, but we also have, let's see, four unknowns actually, because we don't know I, we don't know I3, we don't know I2, we don't know I1. So there are four unknowns. That means we need a fourth equation, and to get that fourth equation, we're going to have to create a junction rule. We haven't done the junction rule yet, but if you look carefully at the diagram, you will notice that two of the currents, the one marked I and the one marked I3, are traveling rightward through the circuit, whereas the other two currents, I2 and I1, are traveling leftward. And basically what we can say is that the currents that are traveling to the right in the circuit, which again are I and I3, must equal the currents that are traveling to the left. So that's going to be I1 plus I2. And so this creates the fourth equation that we need in order to calculate the value of the current flowing through the ammeter. Ultimately, we want the current marked I, don't we? So how do we do that? Well, it turns into a math problem now. So let's take that first equation right here that we had generated, and let's solve that equation for I3. So to do that, we can add the 6I to the other side. We would have 6I3 is equal to 6I. If we divide both sides by six, we can actually see that I3 is equivalent to I. So that means this I3 right here, we're gonna be replacing that with an I. Now what we wanna do is probably solve for I1. So let's do that using this equation. Let's add five I1 to the other side. So we have negative six I plus 4.5 is equal to five I1. And then the next thing we would have to do is divide everything here by five. Those fives will cancel out. Might need to pick up a calculator here. I'm doing it. So negative six divided by five is negative 1.2. So we have negative 1.2i plus, and 4.5 divided by five is 0.9. This is equal to i1. So that means that this i1 can be replaced with negative 1.2i plus 0.9. And that would be that. We can just make a substitution here for i2, and then we're going to be in business. And to get that, why don't we clean up the workspace a little bit here? Why don't we take the only equation we haven't manipulated yet and solve that for I2. Add 10 I2 to the other side. So you have negative six I plus six equals 10 I2. Divide each term by 10 and you would get negative 0.6 I plus 0.6 is equal to I2. Therefore, we can replace I2 with this term right here. So you'll have a negative 0.6 I plus 0.6. Now we can easily solve for i. So over here we have 2i. We can add the negative 1.2 and the negative 0.6. And so you're going to get negative 1.8i. 0 0.9 plus 0 0.6, of course, is 1.5. Add 1.8i to both sides. So you'll get 3.8i is equal to 1.5. And finally, divide both sides by 3.8, and you will get i is equal to about 0.3. 3, 9 amps. That would be the correct answer for the current that is flowing through the ammeter.